Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, this is going to be a continuation of Judas Scepter and Joseph's birthright. But uh, this guy mistakenly believes that Joseph, his children, were half Egyptians. And I'm going to put that to rest. So, uh, I've done a lot of the, this material before. So if anybody's interested in an in-depth study, I'll show you the playlist. I'll just, you know, write me an email or whatever, or leave a comment. But um, why the flood of Noah happened is very, very important. I mean, you know, there's the two, basically the two keys to understanding the Bible is one, who is Israel? I mean, you know, if um, you're watching a movie or reading a book, you want to know who the main character is, what the subject of the book or movie is to understand it. I mean, if you think uh, that Israel is down in Central Africa and the Congo, and you read the Bible and you're like, well, wait a minute. You know, they were to be an ocean going people, but the Congo is landlocked. There's, they don't have any uh, access to ports and they don't have any ships and they don't have any boats. They don't have nothing like that. Well, then you're gonna be off base, I guess you could say, you know, to use a baseball term. So, you know, knowing who the players are is very, very important. Now, if you are what they, I, uh, what I and other, some other people call are universalists, where you believe that anybody can be saved, all they got to do is believe in Jesus, well, you're you're off base too. I mean, these are usually people that have never read the Bible cover to cover and they go to church generally and they read a few verses here and there and they think, oh, well, you know, it, it applies to everybody. You know, if you went to my house and saw a letter addressed to me and open it up and read it and says, oh, okay. Hey, uh, somebody says, thank you very much for your work. And um, I'm going to send you, I don't know, $10 or something, you know. I mean, if you were reading my letter, you say, oh, wow, I'm going to get $10. Wait a minute. The letter is not addressed to you. It's addressed to me. I mean... You know, come on. But that's what the Bible is. So let's take a look at a couple of things here. Now, we're going to be doing a study of Egypt. I want to disprove this J.H. Allen's book, uh, Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright, about uh, Joseph's children being half Egyptians. I want to nail that. Uh, I want to nail that coffin shut and bury it. So, but to do that, we need to take a look at some things. So, all right. So, in um, turn to Ezra chapter nine. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra was the priest, Nehemiah was the king of Judah, 
when they came out of the 70-year captivity of Babylon. Babylon had taken Jerusalem and Judah into captivity for 70 years. And then the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon and they allowed Judah to return to the land. And a lot of people don't know it, but um, the Medes and the Persians became what was known as Parthia or the Parthian Empire, which gave the Roman Empire a run for their money during the days uh, prior to the time of Christ and a little and afterwards. Uh, Rome had some success against fighting the Parthian Empire, but it was not a, ever a lasting success. They they never they won some battles, but the Parthians held their own against the Romans. Matter of fact, the Parthians uh, had conquered the land of we know as Israel uh, prior to the Romans. So. And they're actually mentioned in the book of Acts, the Parthians. And a lot of, some Bible scholars believe that the uh, the wise men that came to Herod, saying that we've seen the uh, Messiah's, you know, the King of Israel's star in the east, that went to Bethlehem and gave uh, Joseph and Mary uh, gold and frankincense and myrrh, as a gift for Christ, the Christ child, uh, they believe that they were Parthians or, you know, Persia and the Medes who had conquered Babylon. Now, uh, physical Babylon had been destroyed and God said it would never be rebuilt. But spiritual Babylon lives on. So, Israel returns to the land. And let's read what Ezra the priest, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says in chapter 9. Well, maybe we should go to chapter 8. Um, Oh, let's see. Yeah, let's go to chapter 8. Um, verse 35. Uh, now, the thing is, Ezra, being allowed of the Persians to return to Jerusalem, to rebuild it, and to reinstitute uh, worship at the temple. Okay, it was destroyed under the Babylonians. So they're, they got a daunting task in front of them to rebuild Jerusalem and to redo the temple. So 35. Also the children of those that had been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offering offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel, 12 bullocks for all Israel, why 12? Well, 12 tribes. 12 bullocks for all Israel, 90 and 6 rams, 70 and 7 lambs, 12 he goats for a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord. And they delivered the Lord's commissions unto the Lord, uh, the king's lieutenants and to the governors on this side of the river. And they furthered the people and the house of God. Let's go to chapter 9. Now, when these things were done, the princes, you know, the princes of Israel, princes of Judah, rather, came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. Ooh. You know, today, if you believe in separation and segregation, 
Isn't that a dirty word? Ooh, he believes in segregation. But the world wants, you know, our political leaders want to mix us all together. They want to mix us all together. But God wants separation and segregation. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. Now, when Babylon conquered, basically they were the first world, uh, the first world's greatest empire. I should say the world's first empire. I mean, they were like, they conquered everything, everywhere. I mean, they conquered the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, I guess you could say. So, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of lands doing according to their abominations. Now, what is an abomination? Abomination is a sin that God really, really, really hates. I mean, all sin is sin. You know, stealing from your neighbor is a sin. But there are things that God calls abominations. And a matter of fact, abominations are called for the death penalty. Now, if you got caught stealing from your neighbor, uh, you were to repay him four times what you stole. So if you stole one piece of silver, you'd have to repay him back four. Oh, but I don't have four pieces of silver. Hey, no problem. Then you were to be sold into uh, slavery until uh, whoever buys you thinks that you've earned your uh, four, you know, your four pieces of silver is worth plus whatever they should get um, for having to cover your debt. I don't know how long it would take to do that, but you know, that's that was the thing. However, if you were using a man for pleasure, if you were a man using another man for pleasure in the bedroom, I hate to even say the word that starts with an S, because of the censors, um, that was an abomination. Witchcraft was an abomination. Those were, the penalty for those sins, abominations, was death. You committed murder, that was another capital punishment. Uh, kidnapping, that was another capital punishment. You know, there was a time America, uh, did capital punishment and we had very little crime back then so the people of israel and the priests and the levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands doing according to their abominations even of the canaanites the hittites now remember esau edom Jacob's, ha uh, Jacob's twin, or brought, well, I, maybe he wasn't an identical twin, but he was, a, he was born, you know, they were twins. He married two Hittite women. Even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Hmm. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, H O L Y, holy seed, you know, if there's a holy seed, there has to be an unholy seed. Why would the Bible say a holy seed? I mean, you know, if you have a royal seed line, you know, you got the King of England, the Queen of England, 
queens and kings of England or Germany? Uh, does that mean that every peasant on every corner in every little hamlet and village is the king? No, absolutely not. I mean, let's face it. You had to be of royal heritage to be the king. I mean, it's just the way, or the queen. That's just the way it is. You know, everybody can't say, well, I'm of the royal line. For they have taken of their daughters, who? The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Egyptians, the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. Wow. Wow. And when I heard this thing, I rent, he ripped, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. He pulled his hair out, people. You think it's a light thing to marry into the Canaanites? And there's people who will tell you, well, you know, that was the Old Testament. Now we got the New Testament, new and improved, New Testament God, Jesus, that changed everything and now God doesn't care who or what you marry, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it kills me. You know, people will spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on a purebred dog. People will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on purebred cattle. People will spend millions of dollars for thoroughbred Horses, race horses, and what have you. Think about it. But it doesn't matter who your son and daughter marries. Oh, it doesn't matter. You know, oh, where you were, you know, that was those old, that was those old laws, and we're, you know, they were a bunch of racists. Well, you know what? Back in those days, when everybody was those racists, um. Let's just say two men who were married didn't adopt little boys. And uh, the purpose of a marriage license back in the 50s and back was so that the state could take a look at the prospective marriage people and make sure that they were of the same heritage, if you catch my drift. There were laws against different, um, let's just say different tribes getting married, especially in the South. Yeah. Supreme Court said, oh, well, that's, you know, that's racist. You can't do that. And they did away with that. And they also, when uh, the Bible, you know, <laughs> people used to separate and segregate themselves Supreme Court says, oh, you can't do that either. You know, you got to be all mixed up. Got to be all mixed up. You know, if you want to know what the Bible position on an issue is, just look at what the world's doing and then do the opposite. If the, Bi if the world says, yeah, this is okay, you know the Bible's against it. I mean, without fail, I cannot think of one instance where the world and the Bible are on the same side. I can't do it. So, why would the Bible be against marriage of Israel, the holy seed with the Canaanites and the Hittites and all the other ites and the Egyptians? See, this Bible study is going to be on the Egyptians, Egypt, Egypt. Egypt was the... Uh, breadbasket of the Middle East. That's why they were always, always getting invaded by uh, everybody. I mean, Babylon, uh, Persia, and um, everybody else because of the Nile River, 
if when you have water in the desert, you're going to have food. And Egypt was, um, well, they were the breadbasket. That's they were they grew wheat, and they grew cotton. Egyptian cotton to this day is very high quality. Uh, Ukraine is the uh, breadbasket of Europe, so sort of like uh, Kansas and Nebraska with America. So here it is, this guy, when he heard, when the priest of Israel heard that there were marriages with all these Canaanites, he's pulling his hair out. I mean, you know, think about it. You know what, why don't we just keep reading this, this chapter here? Because it's all going to tie in. I have a feeling this is going to be a long study, so... Verse 4, Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. These people were trembling at the word of the Lord because of the transgression. What was the transgression? Marrying, marrying into the Canaanites. You know, but if you're a universalist, you think, oh, well, you know, God will, God wants us, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. God loves those Canaanites now. God wants them to be saved and believe in Jesus. I don't think so. Verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush. Uh, oh, wait a minute. What? Blush? What group, what race of people can blush? Um, Af black Africans in Africa? Can they blush? Uh, no. What uh, what race is known for blushing? Hmm. Now I gotta admit, Asians, uh, you know, yellow Chinese, Japanese, uh, they can drink alcohol and their their face will turn flush, you know. But uh, what group of people? Like if you tell a dirty joke to a uh, to a nice you know a, a, a girl and she blushes you know what do you what 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 group of people do you think of and uh, I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count he said oh my god I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee my god for our iniquities, our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities we have, our kings and our priests have delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. What is confusion of face? You ever seen a mixed race person? Is that confusion of face? Is it? Verse 8. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in this holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof. 
and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O oh, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophet, saying, The land which unto which ye go to possess, uh, you go to possess it, is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Does that mean they were leaving their trash laying around? Huh? No, it's spiritually unclean. Now remember, verse 11 here, it says, which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophets, saying, the prophets said this, not just Ezra. So, the land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now, therefore, give not, give not, your daughters unto their sons. Don't give your daughters to these wicked, evil, satanic people. Don't do it. Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever. How long is forever? How long is forever? Oh, that means until Jesus comes and then God changes his mind. And then we have this new and improved universalist God that just loves everybody. I don't think so. But, but I'm a New Testament Christian. That's the Old Testament here. We, we don't pay attention to the Old Testament. That doesn't apply to us. That's for the Jews. Uh, and you wonder why two men are getting married and adopting boys. And you wonder why. And TV programs about Harry Potter and how to be a, a, a saucer and a witch. You know what? America deserves to die. It deserves to die. And the West, the European Union, that deserves to die. They tolerate every filth imaginable. It's amazing. Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace. Don't seek their peace. Don't make peace with these people. Or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. Af and after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. Should we break again thy commandments and join in an affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous and we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. Wow. So what's the solution? Verse chapter 10. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. You know, people, I bet you those Canaanite girls were very pretty. And they probably flashed a lot of skin. And girls, you know how guys can be. You know? It's rare 
when I go to a store and a woman's wearing a full-length dress. It's rare, very rare. I mean, uh, most of the girls nowadays dress like, uh, I've seen hookers. I've seen hookers that wore more clothing than some of the girls in stores nowadays. I, it's, it's sad. And yeah, I used to work downtown Miami and I used to have to drive through the hooker section of town. And if you were stopped at a red light for too long, they'd bang on your window and flash their, uh, their, uh, let's just say they would flash their top at you trying to, uh, entice you to, uh, engage in their business arrangements. Uh, let me just put it that way. And the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives, strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Ah, oh, there's hope in Israel concerning this. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away. What do you mean put away? Divorce. Oh, wait a minute, Chaplain Bob. God hates divorce. God hates divorce. Um, well, yeah, he hates divorce. You know, but uh, when Abraham got a wife for his son, Isaac... Didn't he take it from his own kinfolk? He didn't. He, he said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't take any wives from the Canaanites. Don't do it. Uh-uh. Of course he did. And when Isaac wanted his, uh, well, Isaac's mother, when uh, Isaac's mother sent uh, Jacob away, Jacob Israel, she said, go into my kinsmen. I think it was her brother. I'm not I think Laban. Laban, I think it was her brother. You know, take one of his daughters and have a wife. Carry on the seed line. Don't don't marry a Canaanite. Don't do it. Don't do it. What did Esau do? Eh, I'm not listening to that old fashioned stuff. Look at these, look at this Hittite woman, man. Woo wee doggy, she's a she's a foxy little thing. That's what I want. Never mind. Spiritually and physically polluted, didn't matter. Oh, Esau didn't care. He threw his racial heritage into the toilet, so to speak. Ended up in the sewer plant. So yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them. Get rid of these Canaanites. Separate yourselves. Get rid of these wives. Get rid of these children. Get rid of these husbands. Get rid of them. Tell them, pack your things and leave. According to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We will also be with thee. Be of good church, courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word. And they swear. They divorced their strange wives, the Canaanites. They got rid of them. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you think these people call themselves? Oh, I, hey, I had a Jew for a father. Yeah. So doesn't that make me a Jew? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we don't want to call ourselves Canaanites. Where are the Canaanites today? Is there, 
Has anybody, does anybody know anybody that knows anybody that knows anybody that knows anybody that there's a group of people that call themselves Canaanites? I, I can't find it. Where are they? Where'd they go? I mean, they were more numerous in Israel at one time. Probably still are. Where are they? They're out there somewhere. They probably got a name change. You know, identity theft, right? So, uh, you know, God hates divorce, right? But yet, God's told them to divorce these strange wives and the children. Divorce them. Send them packing. Tell them to get lost. I mean, wow. All right. Well, I think what I'm going to do is break this up into smaller parts. Um, but do you get the idea? Holy seed, H-O-L-Y, you know, not seed with holes in it. No, holy seed, sanctified, set apart. That's what sanctification means. It means something that's set apart. You know, when you take some paper and you set it apart and you're going to print Bibles with it, it's sanctified. You know, you're, uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is something the world, especially the church world, they'll tell you, oh, well, this doesn't matter anymore. You know, they're universalists. I mean, knowing who Israel is, is by in and of itself, it's important. But knowing who Israel is not, and knowing who should be marriage partners, you know, like I say, people, people care more about, you know, uh, purebred dogs and purebred cattle and purebred horses but they don't care who their sons and daughters marry? Really? There's going to be a whole bunch of people. They're going to find out that their grandchildren are not going to be led into the kingdom because they are what the Bible calls mamzers. And the Bible, the, the, the Bible, uh, that's the Hebrew word. And it's, it means mixed mongrel. Really? But the King James translators use the word bastard. And if you look at the modern day meaning of bastard, you know, oh, well, you know, it's not the kid's fault that the, the father didn't, you know, the father of the kid didn't marry his mother. Well, they'll tell you that's what a bastard is. But that's not the, uh, that's the modern meaning. I mean, that's like, you know, in the in the 1920s, before the crash, uh, the depre the depression in the United States. Um, if you said somebody was gay, that meant oh, they're happy, they're happy. Yeah, he's she's a very gay person. You know, she's the life of the party. And I've known people like that. But what does it mean today? Today, it means uh, somebody that commits an abomination. You know, uh, the meanings has changed. Bastard. Mamzer. Mixed mongrel. I mean, I, I could... Uh, it's, it's... And you know what? Uh, even in the 1950s, this was kind of common knowledge. It wasn't until the Supreme Court uh, overruled all the state's laws on all these kind of things. You know, the 60s, you know, that's when uh, the Church of Satan started and what have you. Yeah, yeah. And then drugs went crazy and then uh, what they called free love, uh, just another Fancy catchphrase for uh, fornication. I mean, it's you know, the 60s is when the um, 
the uh, you know if the down going downhill, you know like a roller coaster, you top the crest and you start going down hill fast. Well, America, it was the '60s, and then it just picked up steam in the '70s and the '80s, and next thing you know, uh, people are going to start getting married to animals. Well, I identify as a whatever, yeah. And they, they want to marry a German shepherd or whatever. Ugh, God help us. All right, well, this is going to be... Well, yeah, we're, we're going to cover uh, some things, but this is going to be the end of Ezra chapter 9 study. And uh, I'm slowly getting better, so... All right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.